We're live. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Minnesota Real Estate Journal, RE Journal's Breaking Through the Disruption. It's Wednesday, the 17th, 1 p.m. We have a great economist with us today who's got a fantastic slide deck prepared for y'all that is going to be informative. So what's going to come up, what's now and what's coming up, I think is what she, where she's going to get us. Today, I got to thank sponsors before we get into the CE part of our event. SIOR, CCIM, you guys have been through us all of these webinars with us. We greatly appreciate having people to help us keep, get these launched and keep bringing you information. This is us. In case you weren't aware, RE Journals is a bigger brand than just Minnesota Real Estate Journal. We now have the Illinois Real Estate Journal, Red News in Texas, Midwest Real Estate Journal, and Chicago Industrial Properties. We publish seven in 17 different states, six publications, and we were going to have 104 live events this year. We're still hoping to have 104 live events. But since nobody can get out of their house right now, or at least we can't get into event centers, uh, we've positioned ourselves to do webinars. Been doing those since April. This is our 46th webinar. We've had over 20,000 viewers. So extra special thanks to all of you. Today's event is approved for continuing education credit. So for those of you that have been logging on and getting CE from us, you kind of know the drill, but I got to go through it anyways. How do we track attendance? Uh, each attendee is timestamped when entering and exiting the web the webinar, so we know how long you're on here. But we also have to ask you two random polling questions during the one hour. So I'll chime in in the middle of this event and ask you a question. You need to go into the chat room and enter your answer. That way it logs in that you were paying attention for the whole event, okay? Uh, so I'm going to read the language here that I have to read. This webinar has been approved by the Minnesota Commissioner of Commerce for one hour of real estate continuing education. Thank you for helping us comply with those rules. We appreciate it. If you have connection issues, uh, I am seeing that we have five bars on our server, so we're in good shape. If you have a connection issue, it's most likely on your end. So if you see one of us glitch or you hear your sound cutting out, there's a button at the top of your screen that says reconnect, it's red. Hit that button, that should solve just about everything. If it doesn't, log out, log back in. If that doesn't work, Google Chrome on a PC is the best uh, browser to use. You can also use your phone. If you're on an Android, use Chrome. If you're on a uh, Apple or a smart, uh, iPhone, use Safari. If that doesn't work, you can kind of copy and paste the link we sent you into something. You'll get it working, I trust you. Okay, the chat room on the right, we talked about it. That's where you answer CE questions, but that's where you're also going to ask questions of speakers. When you do ask a question, I'll go in and flag it red. Um, so have patience and we'll get to them all at the end. Uh, so please use that chat room. Uh, polls I'm not going to do today because it confuses CE. Uh, lastly, so that you don't have to ask, we are going to record this. We already started. It will be included on our YouTube channel and also on our website, rejournals.com slash video replay, or just go to rejournals.com, click on our webinars. You can see everything that's upcoming and everything we've rec recorded. They're all out there for free, so feel free to go back and watch some of those. So here we are. Minnesota Economic Update and the Impact on Real Estate. All right, Laura, I'm going to put up a slide with your contact info. I hope you're okay with that. Yeah. So this is who you are, Chief Economist for the State of Minnesota, but you're also at the University of Minnesota, correct? So you're wearing right. multiple hats and have right. the knowledge that we all kind of need. So as real estate people, we can kind of figure out what's going on the ground. Uh, what what are tenancy, what are vacancy rates, what are rental rates and stuff. But but the economy right now is affecting a lot of things. So I'm hoping that you can answer that for us. I'm going to give control over to you. Would you like me to open your PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Okay, well, here we go. And I will still be here for you all, and I'll bump back in when we have to do a continuing question. So here we go. All Thank right. you. Great. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you to the Minnesota Real, Minnesota Real Estate Journal for inviting me. Um, I am I'm the state economist. I'm also a professor of applied economics at the University of Minnesota. So I do split my time between those two roles. The main responsibility for of the Minnesota state economist is to uh, produce the twice yearly economic and revenue forecasts for the state of Minnesota. So normally we produce a forecast every November and every February um, under very unusual circumstances having to do with the current uh, pandemic and economic downturn. We produced an interim budget projection uh, in May. And so I will talk about that. 
uh, and what that what that means. But my office, the Office of Economic Analysis at Minnesota Management and Budget, our responsibility is forecasting the state economy and tax revenues. So um, the budget forecast also includes a forecast of expenditures. That's uh, the responsibility of another part of the um, of Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, but I can talk a little bit about that. So how I'm going to proceed is I'm going to start by presenting the U.S. outlook. So what the forecast is for the U.S. economy, um, focusing on what the forecast looked like at the time that we produced our interim budget projection. So we produced our interim projection. We released it at the beginning of May. And that was based on a U.S. economic forecast or informed by a U.S. economic forecast that was produced at the beginning of April. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about how things have changed since then. Uh, then I'm going to move to Minnesota's economy and what's been going on here uh, in the state economy, specifically uh, what's been going on related to the, uh, the economic downturn resulting from the pandemic. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the budget projection uh, that we produced in May. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to finish with some points about the differential impacts of this particular economic downturn. So let's get started and talk about the U.S. economy. The um, the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 of the pandemic and the measures taken to prevent its spread dramatically weakened the US, the outlook for US growth since we released our forecast in February. So normally when I, when I talk about a forecast, I talk about it compared to the prior forecast. So we released our official forecast at the end of February and then as you know, things changed dramatically. Um, we don't produce, my office doesn't produce a forecast of the U.S. economy. We purchase a forecast from a macroeconomic consulting firm called IHS. Uh, in April, IHS was forecasting a three-quarter recession for the United States, resulting in a 5.4% decline in real GDP for this year. In contrast, in February, when we produced our, our normal budget uh, forecast, they were projecting a 2.1% growth in GDP for this year. So they went from in between February and April from 2.1% growth to 5.4% contraction or decline. Uh, since April, their outlook has further worsened to an expected 8.1% decline this year in their June outlook. So they produce an outlook every month. So the first chart that you're looking at shows the level of real GDP. I often show charts that show the growth rates, but this time I'm showing you the level of real GDP for the United States. The solid line shows the history and IHS's April outlook. The dotted line shows their February outlook. So in the, in the solid line, you can see this is quarterly data. So in the solid line, you can see three consecutive quarters of negative of going down, and then you can see a quarter uh, a quarter's turn positive at that point. So we start to turn up at that point. IHS notes that their outlook depends critically on the path of the pandemic. So they've had to make assumptions about the path of the pandemic, and that informs what they think is going to happen to the economy. They expect the spread of COVID-19 to peak and then dissipate in the second calendar quarter of 2020. So we are at the end of that second calendar quarter. So it is now that they, are, that they have been expecting uh, the spread of the disease to dissipate. And that would allow social distancing restrictions to be lifted during the third quarter, which is late summer or early fall. So those social distancing restrictions, some of those have been lifted, are being lifted right now. So it's approximately the same uh, time, same timeline that they had expected in April. Uh, economic recovery begins uh, in the fall and uh, real GDP growth turns positive toward the end of the year in their outlook. Um, in their April outlook, so you can see it, you get to the bottom of that that V or that U in the dark line, it turns positive there. And so in their April outlook, they expected real GDP growth next year in 2020, 2021 to be 6.3%. So in the chart, I've, I've shown you the, the, the February number, 2.1% growth for this year. 
April went down to minus 5.4 and June went down to minus 8.1. Uh, so in their June outlook, they expect 8.1% contraction this year and then 5.2% growth next year. You can also see from the graph, if you look at that, look at that um, solid line again, you can see that IHS expects real GDP to reach its pre-pandemic level in mid-21. So you can see where where we where the pandemic hits in March uh, and we see the declines, that level, we get back to that level around the midpoint of next year. But within this projection horizon, so within the horizon that, that Minnesota Management and Budget projected the budget, GDP does not get back to where it would have been without the pandemic. We never get back to that dotted line. So that means that some amount of GDP is simply lost. Consumer spending, so the next chart shows levels of real consumer spending. Consumer spending accounts for about two thirds of real GDP. So it's an important component, the most important component of GDP. In addition to that, during the economic expansion that just ended was the of, of record length. It was the longest economic expansion on record for the United States. During that expansion, consumer spending grew more consistently than other components of GDP. So business investment, for instance, uh, which accounts for about 17% of GDP, business investment had some good, good times and bad times during that um, during that expansion, but consumer spending was really quite steady. So consumer spending was the engine of that uh, expansion that we just that we just finished with uh, with the pandemic. Um, but consumer spending has been hit hard by the pandemic crisis, as you know. Temporary business closures, social distancing measures, volatile financial markets, rising unemployment and declining wage income contribute to a forecast five and a half percent decline in real consumer spending this year. Uh, that is in contrast to 2.6 percent growth that had been expected in February. That outlook has also worsened since April to an 8.6 percent decline in IHS's June uh, forecast. So it's the same kind of picture as we saw with GDP, it's a little, it's a sharper decline. And then the growth rate that we get back to, we never get back up to that dotted line, but the growth rate we get back to is actually lower than what, uh, what we had before, whereas the GDP line is closer to the same slope as um, the February line. So the shock to the US economy from this pandemic is, is really unprecedented in modern history. And the economic outlook is exceptionally uh, uncertain and volatile. You can see that just by seeing how the economic outlook has changed month to month since uh, since April, since we produced our, uh, our revenue um, projection. Economic outcomes will depend critically on the pandemic's course. So changes in the pandemic's course will change what the outlook is. Um, it will depend, it depends critically on the prospects for effective treatment and vaccine. At the moment, IHS is not anticipating uh, big changes in treatment or vaccine. Uh, so that is not, that's not in there. Um, it will, it depends on government restrictions on economic activity, of course, and whether we can continue to relax those or whether they have to be reinstated later if there's a second wave. And it depends very importantly on consumer and business responses to those restrictions as they are lifted. So it is, it's important what governments choose to do here in terms of adding restrictions or reducing restrictions, but it is more the, the forecast actually depends more critically on how individuals, individual households and businesses respond. Um, it also the, the path all of the recovery also depends on uh, the impact of fiscal and monetary policies. So all of the fiscal policy and all of the monetary policy changes that have been made since April are incorporated into, uh, into the outlooks or that were made between February and April were incorporated into the outlook. But we simply don't know yet what the impact of all of those things will be, nor do we know what might come later. Um, when what might come in particular in the form of um, uh, more additional funding or support for state government. So the U.S. economic outlook is going to remain uncertain 
for and volatile for quite some time. Minnesota's economy is closely related to the U.S. economy. Minnesota has a distribution of employment across industries. So think of an industry structure that looks very similar to that of the United States. We have a diverse industrial base with employment distributed across major industries in Minnesota, similarly, not exactly, but similarly to how it is in, in the United States. That means that Minnesota is closely tied to the U.S. Uh, Minnesota's outlook is closely tied to the U.S. outlook. Uh, it also means that uh, Minnesota uh, tends to have resilience during an economic downturn, but this unprecedented downturn um, is likely to test that, that theory or that um, way of looking. So let me move to Minnesota's economy. Uh, Minnesota entered the COVID-19 crisis in very good economic shape. We had very low unemployment. Our unemployment rate was one of the lowest in the nation. Our labor force participation rate was extremely high. So that's the share of the uh, over age 16 population that is either working or actively looking for work. So that labor force participation rate was very high, much higher than the United States. Uh, labor force participation rate and usually the first or the top or the first or the second um, ranking among states. Our unemployment rate was very low and had been low uh, for some time. It had started to tick up um, prior to the pandemic, but it was still very low. We had a very high demand for labor. Um, oh, actually, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I, I, I've jumped ahead a bit to talking more about Minnesota. So just let me just finish the, um, the, the landscape for, um, for Minnesota. We had a very high demand for labor and low unemployment. The high, that meant that throughout the state, we had more um, people looking for work. I'm sorry, more jobs available than there were people looking for work. So it was a very high demand for labor. Um, there are st a lot of states had similar uh, circumstances and that ratio of unemployed job seekers to open positions that was similar in the United in, across the US. So we had high demand for labor across the US and relatively low unemployment across the US. And then the pandemic hit and things changed dramatically. So the chart you're looking at now, the one that says US unemployment insurance claims surge um, shows the in the height of the bars, it shows the number of initial claims for unemployment insurance benefits in the United States by week of the year. So across the horizontal axis, we have the number of the weeks of the year. So the height of the bars shows um, how many people applied for unemployment insurance in those weeks. You see, we had these really low numbers going up to the middle of March, and then we jumped up to 3 million people applying for unemployment insurance claims. And then the following week, 7 million people, and then another six and a half million people. And it is, it's just a, a dramatic, been a dramatic change, as I said, unprecedented, um, dramatic change in the labor market. Uh, a change that was the result of restrictions on people, on consumers' ability to spend money in the way that they had been had been doing. Um, it affected in particular consumers' ability to spend on services, of course, travel, recreation, entertainment, uh, restaurant meals, all of those things were restricted. And then as those things were restricted and people working in those industries got laid off, that meant that wages and salaries generally fell. And so higher unemployment, lower wages, all of that is a negative feedback into consumer spending. Another aspect of consumer spending and the impact, uh, impact there is that when financial markets are volatile, so for instance, when the stock market is volatile uh, and equity prices go down, that means that household wealth goes down. So in the United States, the biggest shares of household wealth are equities, so people having stock portfolios or, or financial asset portfolios and their homes. 
And so when people are wealthier, so when stock market goes up, they tend to spend more. And that's called a positive wealth effect. When the market goes down, people tend to feel, feel less wealthy, they are less wealthy, they spend less. That's a negative wealth effect. So volatility in the stock market has feed, fed into a negative wealth effect for consumers. It also is, it's exacerbated simply by uncertainty, that when consumers are uncertain about the future, they're less confident in their ability to spend, and they're less confident in making choices to spend, um, to spend big money. So all of that has, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I thought you were at a good pause. I got to just yeah. jump in real quick and ask a question. Everyone right. that's, I know you all aren't multitasking and everybody is closely paying attention, but now is your chance. So go in the chat room and here's your question. This is from Laura. She wants to know uh, well, how you all feel about um, office vacancy uh, and what it's going to change here as a result of people learning to work from home. Do businesses adapt and need less space? I think we've heard on our webinars other people say businesses need more space to accommodate for social distancing. So go in the chat room, answer that question. Do you believe that space, that more space will be available, vacancies will rise, the two factors kind of offset each other? What is your personal prediction for the office market in Minnesota? And I will uh, log back or disappear here for, again for a little bit. Thank you, Laura. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. I'm glad you got a chance to ask that question. I'm I'm eager to uh, see what the answers are. Um, I'll have to look at those later. It looks like they're going. It's going both both directions, se several directions. Interesting. It's going to be all over the board. I t I've it's asked this question a couple times. See, it's the push and pull may balance each other off, but I think it remains to be seen. Thank you, everybody, for putting that out there. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so unemployment insurance claims. And let me say something more about unemployment insurance claims in general. So one of the things that has been enormously challenging in this economic environment is that economic data lag what you see in your daily life with regard to the economy. So we see things going on in the economy and we think that's going to show up tomorrow in the economic data and it doesn't. All the economic data is lagged. And so it's been a, a real challenge trying to figure out how things are going how to forecast and figure out how things are going to change. But one of the pieces of information that actually is produced frequently enough that it tells us something not quite in real time, but in closer to real time are these unemployment insurance claims. Uh, because they they um, are leading indicators of the unemployment rate because they get they get published weekly as you can see in this chart. So let's move uh, to Minnesota and talk about how this looked in Minnesota. So it's similar information, but I've just I've displayed it differently here. So this is Minnesota unemployment insurance claims. And across the horizontal axis, I have the weeks since the start of the year. So first week of the year, third week of the year, fifth week of the year. And then the lines show the mark for each week, the number of initial unemployment insurance claims uh, for Minnesota. So let's start actually, you know, the big, the, the, the big picture is the green line, but let's actually start with the blue line at the bottom of the, the page. Um, that is that tracks un, initial unemployment insurance claims for last year, so 2019. So you can see that the numbers were very low. As I said, we had a low, very low unemployment rate throughout um, last year. Uh, there's some variation, um, but it doesn't. It's it it's quite low. Uh, and then for comparison, we decided to look at a year during the Great Recession, so when Minnesota did lose a lot of jobs. Um, and that's the next line, the red line, and that's for 2009. So you can see the pattern is pretty similar, the variation is similar, but it's quite a bit higher than the blue line. So we had um, more unemployment insurance claims going on uh, during 2009. Then look at the green line, which is this year, 2020. If you look, go, go to the left-hand side of the graph and start with the first year of the first week of the year. And you can see that unemployment insurance claims this year were in Minnesota, were tracking quite well the claims for the prior year. So it looked like it looked like 2020 was going to look a lot like 2019. That you know unemployment was going to stay low, and then you get to the middle of March, 
the pandemic becomes a thing and social restrictions come into, into play, business restrictions come into place, and we see this really unprecedented spike in the number of unemployment insurance claims in Minnesota. That peak in that 11th week there, that's 115,000 claims. That's un, that's, that is, as I said, unprecedented. And then the next week was just as over 100,000, and the next week was over 100,000, and the next week was too. It has since finally come down, come down quite a lot, the weekly claims. Um, but since mid-March, there have been 776,000 applications for UI benefits in Minnesota. We know that we're not really comparing apples to apples when we look at these data compared to other years because policies have changed here. Um, we know, for instance, that a lot of this is, was meant to be temporary at the time that people were laid off because the business closures were temporary. But it's not clear that everybody, as businesses are opening, that everybody, not everybody's getting their job back because businesses are opening not at full capacity. Um, we also know that this time around, we have um, claims by uh, claims allowed by people who were laid off, who lost their jobs because of economic reasons, and who, people who uh, still have their job but had significant decreases in the number of um, uh, in their hours, in their working hours. So if you had hours constricted, then you can be in there. And based on federal changes in the federal law, uh, people who are self-employed can also be in here. So it's not apples to apples, but it doesn't really need to be to show to show what's happened here. Okay, so so this is this is the the environment we were in after we did our February forecast. And then all of this happened. So let's talk about what we did about that. I don't think Minnesota management and budget has ever produced, uh, at, or at least not, in, certainly not in my memory, but not even in, in decades of memory, um, has produced an interim projection. We do our November forecast and our February forecast, and that's, that's it. But this, these extraordinary conditions required that we update the budget forecast. Uh, policymakers, we knew that our prior forecast was not holding. Um, normally, we don't know that as clearly, but based on the economic conditions changing so much, we knew that they did that the budget budgetary conditions were changing too. Um, so we needed to inform policymakers as they make decisions about uses of resources. Uh, normally, our budget forecasts cover two biennia. So Minnesota has a two-year or a biennial budget. So our budget forecasts cover the current budget and then the next year, the next biennium. So two, year, two years, the current biennium and then two years after that. Um, but because it's impossible to forecast that far out right now under these volatile conditions, um, and because the most critical question was what's happening in this biennium, uh, we only updated our projection for the current biennium. And we have updated major revenues and select expenditures. So the, um, the bottom line the, that you heard about in the newspaper is that we, Minnesota has a projected $2.426 billion deficit. Um, this is in contrast to our February budget forecast that had a $1.5 billion projected surplus. So things really changed significantly. Um, that projected deficit, it's important to note, is before use of the budget reserve. So Minnesota has a healthy um, budget reserve of $2.359 billion um, that has been built up carefully and assiduously over the years of that economic expansion. Minnesota has a budget reserve policy that says that uh, in the November forecast, in every November forecast, if uh, there is a projected surplus for the current biennium, 33% of that surplus is automatically transferred to the budget reserve until the budget reserve reaches a target level. And that target level is set by my office. We do an analysis of the volatility of the revenues for the state of Minnesota and determine uh, a target for the budget reserve. And so that the 2.359 had been full. So that meant that we had reached our target for the budget reserve and then, um, and then the rainy day occurred. Uh, so that deficit, $2.426 billion deficit, that's the result of changes in both 
the spending side and revenue side, but my office does the revenue side, so I'm going to focus on that. There were changes on the spending side too, um, but uh, I'm not gonna focus on those details. So here's what happened on the revenue side. So this is um, the change column is the change since the prior forecast, which was February. And then the May projection is the left-hand column. So total general fund revenues for the current biennium are now projected to be $3.611 billion less than the February 2020 forecast. Um, and the estimates for all, as you can see, for all the major tax types were reduced. You know, we reduced them in our, our projection. Individual income tax receipts are now forecast to be uh, $1.659 billion less than the February forecast. And that decrease is primarily due to a lower forecast for wage and salary income in Minnesota. So that is, if you sum up all of the payrolls of all the employers of the state of Minnesota, we estimate how that's going to grow over time. And we lowered our forecast for how that's going to grow based on um, the, the dramatic changes in the economy. Um, it also The decrease is also due to a decline in growth in non-wage income. Um, such as capital gains and business income. The sales tax change is due to significant change in the forecast for consumer spending that I showed you in the second slide. And then the corporate tax is projected to generate $404 million less than the prior forecast based on a lower forecast for corporate profits. So that's how change in the economy, change in the US economy, changed our outlook on Minnesota's economy which changed our outlook on Minnesota revenues. Now, whenever I, we produce a, a forecast, um, or this is an extraordinary projection, not a full forecast, but in any case, uh, I always focus uh, on some of the unknowns or the risks to the forecast so that people know what those risks are. And indeed, in our February forecast, we did highlight that the pandemic itself was a significant risk to that forecast. Uh, but let me reiter reiterate some of the risks that I've talked about already. So I talked about the path of the pandemic and how when that changes, the U.S. outlook is going to change and that will affect what we think is happening in Minnesota. But related to the path of the pandemic is the path of consumer and business confidence. So businesses that were temporarily closed due to social distancing measures or that have seen declines in revenues are determining whether they have the means to survive long enough to reopen. And businesses that are reopening are doing so under circumstances that are quite different than what they expected. And so their business models are all changing. They're incurring costs that they hadn't expected to incur, um, costs to keep people safe, uh, keep their employees and customers safe, um, and their revenue model is different because businesses are opening not at full capacity. Uh, and you know, and if you've seen this if you've gone to get, get a haircut or gone to a restaurant is that um, businesses are not operating per their planned business model. So uh, all of those people who have got, uh, applied for unemployment insurance benefits, as these businesses open, how many of those, them are going to get their, those jobs back? Increased financial market volatility hinders consumer spending by, as I said, lowering household wealth. Uh, the impact of federal fiscal and monetary policy is uncertain, as is the extent of additional federal financial support for the states. Um, Minnesota, at most states, uh, all states, I think, uh, delayed, allowed taxpayers to delay payments of certain kinds of taxes. So. Your tax year 19 income tax bill wasn't due on April 15th, it's due July 15th. Uh, so that's been delayed. And sales taxes have been delayed by month, month to month as well. So what that means is that when we're doing a projection, we're, do, we're, we're forecasting revenues, we're doing it with less information than we normally have. Because those delays, which were done in order to relieve burden on taxpayers, uh, that's, that's, you know, a logical policy to have. It means that we're not getting signals about the economy that we normally do. And so normally we look to sales tax receipts, for instance, and withholding on income tax, income tax withholding as measures of what's happening in relatively real time in the economy. But those signals are all muddied 
now because of the revenue delays. And then a, a point that I make with, with uh, most forecasts is that we're still, we're 14 months until the end of, at least at the time in May when we produce this, um, 14 months until the end of the biennium. So there is a lot that can happen between now and the end of the biennium. And even small changes in growth, assumed growth rates for volatile income sources, such as capital gains um, and such as corporate profits, even small changes in those growth rates can have a big impact on the revenue forecast for this biennium and for the next. Another um, risk to talk about here is that, as I said, we did not project to the next biennium, but any solution that the legislature and the governor agree to, to solve the budgetary problem that the $2.4 billion projected deficit for this biennium, um, that has to take into consideration the fact that all of these things that affected this biennium are also going to affect the next. And so uh, we need to be having a long view here um, when thinking about solutions. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm make a quick point about differential impacts of the economic downturn. This is a quote from uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Jerome Powell, uh, making the point that this, the pandemic and the economic impact of the pandemic has affected everyone. Every industry is affected, every household is affected, every business is affected, every nonprofit, every government has been affected. But the burden has not, has not been, has not fallen uniformly across those affected. The burden has fallen most heavily on those least able to bear it. There have been differential impacts of this, uh, of this um, event that are uh, unusual among um, economic in in, um, in the business cycle and and really test the limits of our ability to to do economic modeling. So there have been differential impacts, of course, across industries. We talked about the entertainment and um, restaurant industries, service industries in general. Uh, but if you look at the unemployment insurance claims, though the, that information is not available by industry, but it is available by occupation. And so what we've done here is we've sorted um, Minnesota UI claims since mid-March by occupation. And the height of the bar in each case shows the number of people in that occupation who applied for unemployment insurance claims uh, since the, the, um, the crisis hit. Now, one thing to note is that it's, it's actually pretty broadly affected people. I mean, there are significant claims there by people in construction, um, in management, in healthcare, in production. Uh, so there have been lots of different kinds of businesses and occupations that have been affected. But that really tall bar at the left-hand side is food preparation and serving related. And then the next one is sales. The next one is office support. And so you know, as, you know, as we've watched this play out, that people in those sectors have taken on more of the burden than people in other sectors. So what we did, in addition to looking at the claims by occupation, is that then we looked at the average hourly earnings, or sorry, not sorry, the average, the median hourly earnings uh, per occupation. So we went to, used information for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, DEED, uh, and looked at the, the average hourly earnings, average hourly wages by, I'm sorry, I said it again, median hourly earnings, by occupation and ranked them from lowest to highest and ranked them and placed them into quintiles, 20% groups. And so the lowest earners, the first quintile, uh, accounts for 37% of those claims. And if you add in the second quintile, then it means that more than 60% of the claims are for people in those first, those lowest two quintiles. Uh, so it means that it, it reinforces Chairman Powell's point that the impact of this downturn is not being felt uniformly, it's being felt differentially, uh, and it's being felt more so by people in the lowest wage earning um, categories. 
and the, the people in those categories or in those occupations are disproportionately women, they're disproportionately people of color, they're disproportionately young people. Uh, so that burden is, um, is being felt differently and solutions to the budget problem in reaction to, um, to the economic downturn uh, will be taking that into consideration. So that concludes my prepared remarks. I am happy to take questions. How do we want to do this? We have a few. So right. first, I want to say thank you. Uh, this was great information. Um, I also want to point out, Laura, if you look at the chat room, I'm gonna, I got to bring it back up here on my screen. Reed Christensen says office vacancy will stay the same, but will start to drop with all the pent up demand once we are back. So Reed's out in that office market every day. So I know he knows there must be people looking for space that are putting off going to look at future office space. So maybe Reed's right, but then you scroll down and there's a lot of really well-respected office people here that have the opposite opinion. So I'm, wow. Unfortunately, I think you got an answer that's clear as mud. Probably a little right. like economics, I suppose, huh? Yeah, well, fair enough. When people ask me, that, at least I can say that. I can say the, maybe. the real estate experts say this, say it's not clear yet. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so I have a couple things. I, first of all, I got to ask the audience another question. So if you're there and you're getting CE, oh, did somebody ask a, a regular question? Okay, so I've got a couple things for COVID-19 on that. So don't ask another question for a minute here. I'm asking you a question. What I need to know is for Minnesota Real Estate Journal, we like to hold live events because people like to get together, shake hands, talk about deals, where Reed can have that conversation with Bob Pfefferly below him and they can talk about it and, and get to a conclusion maybe, but in a live environment. So please put up there one of three choices that you're ready to go to a live event because under the governor's rules right now, we can have smaller live events and then we can simulcast them out through a webinar thing. Or tell us if you're unsure, I'm really not sure yet, I kind of want to see that other people go to an event first, then maybe I'll go. Or no, it's just not a good time to go out and go to a crowded room or potentially a crowded room. So please put in there one of three answers. Yes, I'm ready to attend a Minnesota Real Estate Journal event live, unsure, or no thank you. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, knowing that. So, okay. So Laura here, I wrote down a few questions. Um, the first one, I really appreciate that you mentioned that uh, about how this affects people that can afford it the least. I know there's a lot of chatter early on with people wanting to reopen the economy and business people are saying, we need to get back open so that we can have, you know, provide jobs and people say, you're just selfish and this is a rich people problem. And a lot of people at my level were saying, this is not a rich people problem. You all don't realize it's going to affect the people that can't afford to be off work for three months. They haven't saved for that. They're not ready for that. So thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So here we go. Well, so one of the questions I've had from the beginning, we had an economist on who was more of a real estate guy, but he thought this might be, uh oh, lost your picture. He thought it might be a job recovery. So if you can hear me, do you feel like jobs are going to lag the uptick in consumer spending and GDP that we're going to see? Uh, are jobs going to lag the uptick? Yeah, so do, do we see an increase in GDP before yeah. we see our unemployment numbers start to correct? Um, I think, well, I think we're going to see pretty dramatic changes in unemployment numbers because a lot of the, a lot of those layoffs were indeed temporary and people will go back, will get those jobs back. I mean, there were big companies with, um, you know, big professional service companies that had people go on furlough and those people are going to get their jobs back. So we will see a, a, a sharp change in unemployment. But I also can see, can imagine that for the businesses that are in the affected sector, so those customer facing sectors that have been affected by, by, the, um, by the restrictions, I could see them be proceeding very cautiously going forward with regard to uh, hiring people because their business models have changed and they need time to figure out how many people do I really need? Now that I can only seat 50% of the people in my restaurant, I'm, I can't bring back 100% of my employees. 
so I could see I can see that in in maybe the professional services sectors, the law firms, the accounting firms, um, uh, manufacturing that laid people off temporarily, those folks are going to come back. But I think in um, in entertainment, in accommodation, in travel, in restaurants, I think it's going to take a while. I like that. Oh, and I got a question here. I want to make sure it doesn't disappear amongst the other ones. We'll get to that. That's a good one. So, they, so, and this is back to that same early economic forecast that I was a part of, or the event that I was a part of. Um, and there, you said there was an uptick in unemployment in March before this hit. So I think some economists, correct me if I'm wrong, were kind of saying January, February, March, they're like, we might be seeing early signs of some type of a recession. So is this just that self-fulfilled prophecy that was coming? Here it is, and maybe companies will use it to take a bath or to maybe shed employees that weren't really a fit, but you couldn't afford to get rid of because you're growing so fast. Um, what, were we on the precipice of something that now has come true, do you believe? Mm, I, I think that if the pandemic hadn't happened there. Okay. Let me put it this way at when earlier in the year at the, toward the end of last year and earlier this year, Minnesota's unemployment rate was starting to tick up and starting to close the gap with the U S unemployment rate. Okay. So it started to look to us like, Hmm, you know, we're very, this is a record length expansion and how long can a record length expansion go on? And unemployment is very low, but it started, it's starting to tick up a little bit. It feels like the economy, or it, indeed, the economy was at high risk for a negative shock. So, and GDP growth was very low, was, was relatively low. So when you have GDP growth that's in threes, 3.1 or so, if you have a negative shock, so something bad happens to the global economy, you might be able to absorb it and get down to one and a half percent GDP growth, but you're not in a recession. But we were in, we were under two uh, in 2% 2 growth and unemployment was starting to tick up. It felt like if something bad happens, it's definitely going to kick the economy into a recession. And so it, something very bad happened that there's, you know, this is a textbook example of a negative shock. Um, people, people, when I used to talk about a negative shock, they'd say, well, what do you mean by a negative shock? And I usually would say, well, a, you know, a war or a climate event, the pandemic wasn't usually the thing that I mentioned, but that's going to be first on my list now. Um, so uh, I think that the unemployment rate starting to come up was a, part of a long series of information that had us thinking we're at risk for a recession. I don't think that it added much more information than the fact that we were in the longest economic expansion the country has ever seen, and therefore we're vulnerable. Well, and so early on, I predicted that this was going to be so bad, and it turned out to unfortunately be true. Um, I just initially, when I found out, I was in spring break, when we found out the world was shutting down, I went out and looked, how many people are employed by the hospitality industry and retail industry? Because they're all going to be out of work next week. It's like 30 to 40 million people in the United States. So it, it hit bad. And, and, and I started to think about what does this mean? Can the government bail us out? And my initial thought was no way there's not enough money on the planet because they've got to have tax revenue. And like you said, now we're running a deficit. No tax revenue means we can't afford to bail you out. And I think the federal government did the most brilliant thing I've ever seen politicians do. The Paycheck Protection Program was genius. It kept people employed. I think mentally that helped people. They kept their health insurance. They kept their job title. They didn't have to worry about losing their job or being furloughed. I, th I think that was huge. Do you think that a lot of these government and then the and then the, what they did for the um, for the unemployment, the extra unemployment? Do you think those measures are without them we would have been doomed? And how much have they helped? And are they going to get us through this? Or is there maybe still a little more need for something? Those measures were extremely important and continue to be important for this would have been much worse in the absence of that kind of action. Um, and there's room for more action by the federal government. And this illustrates a really important difference between the federal government and state governments. So the question, can government bail us out? Well, it depends on which government you're talking about. So the state 
has to balance its budget. And so this is, it's an illustration of the cruel irony of the business, the impact of the business cycle on state budgets. That at the time when revenues start to fall, demand for services goes up because people are lower income and so they seek some of those, they seek those services. And the state can't, in, just can't do stimulus spending, can't say, well, let's just increase spending because the revenues aren't there and they need to balance. And so it's more of a zero sum game for the state, but the federal government can run a deficit and indeed runs an enormous deficit. And eventually that debt that the federal government is carrying slows the economy down. But when you're in a crisis, it's the federal government that should deficit finance that kind of fiscal stimulus spending because the states can't. And getting money from the federal government to the states is enormously helpful too because it helps the state balance their budget in a way that doesn't reduce needed services for Minnesotans. Yeah, I see Darren Jorgensen in here says, do deficits matter and do they affect the short and long term? And you just addressed that, yeah. I mean, it's going to hurt, but without it, I think you're saying that things are much worse. Yeah. So, well, I think we'll we'll live with the more, lesser of two evils, right? Um, I thought yeah. it was interesting too. Go ahead. I was just going to say that when times are good, and when you're in an expansion, then that's a good time to address the federal deficit. Yeah, and kudos to you and your office for having a budget reserve. I. I, I, I didn't put two and two together that you calculated that and kept that. Um, yeah. it, right now, it looks like genius. I think people at the time were saying, if we've got a budget reserve, can you please refund our taxes? Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, people are living on month to month and tight incomes. Um, mm -hmm. But now it looks brilliant. Um, I, and I go back to in May, uh, in commercial real estate, we read different articles than you do probably. But somebody had said the Mall of America can't pay its loan payment. And, uh, and they're looking for loan relief or whatever. And then somebody in the comments said, look, if us consumers are supposed to have six months worth of saving, why doesn't the Mall of America have six months worth of saving? And I thought, no one ever planned for every tenant in the building to stop paying rent, right? So mm -hmm. no one ever planned for the entire economy not going to work the next day. But do you feel like I mean, we see the deficit, but we see that you have some reserves. Do you feel like we're going to be able to work through in Minnesota this budget deficit? Is it is it a solvable mm -hmm. problem? It is a solvable problem. Uh, you know, we've solved bigger problems. You know, af after the Great Recession, we had a, a six billion dollar deficit. So um, it is a solvable problem. We are we are. It is extremely good policy that we have the budget reserve. And not only that, but we have all other budgetary tools in our toolbox. The Commissioner of Management and Budget has opportunities to um, that that I'm not I don't know all the details of, but I know that we have a lot of flexibility in in the budget, and we have we can uh, change the budget, we can raise revenues, we can reduce spending. So there are things that can be done to solve this. I uh, I my um, my recommendations would be to maintain flexibility. So because that economic outlook is volatile, it's changing month to month, it could get much worse, it could get better. Um, so the, the solutions should be things that can be increased or decreased as necessary. Uh, and the budget reserve is, you know, kind of conveniently, it's in the same ballpark of magnitude as the the deficit, but if we use it all up now, we don't have anything for the next biennium, which is going to have a deficit as well. So uh, you, using, you know, being judicious about how we use that budget reserve um, will be important, but gosh, we're in much better shape than if we didn't have that. Okay, I think that's great. So I want to try to sum up some of the other questions we saw in the chat room and things I thought of while you were talking, really related to, so we're, we see the we see the line kind of come back. We're back. People are going to restaurants. Things feel pretty good. But we're still seeing at 50% um, capacity for a restaurant. So they may have no taxable income for the year, even though they may come back and not be losing as much. Uh, then the event industry, the travel, tourism, all that stuff is, is back in small amounts. So not as much as it was before. And then this idea that we may have a wave in the fall. Um, 
so are you projecting out some of those things that that could be variable and worse? Like you, I think you just said it's constantly changing, but mm-hmm. how are you thinking of as maybe the question of the, the, the businesses that might not come back 100% plus the possibility of a fall resurgence? Yeah. Um, so I think I mentioned that what matters more for the forecast is how businesses and consumers act rather than, and it's, and what matters less is what the governments actually do. So that consumer business confidence matters a lot. And that is factored in that we do not, neither IHS in the U, doing the US forecast nor we doing our Minnesota forecast assumed that as soon as businesses are allowed to open that that switch is gonna get flipped and they're gonna go, that everybody's gonna come back. We assume that there's, that there's a graduated uh, time, time period there. Um, so I think I would say that that's figured in. IHS has done um, is has done more alternative scenarios than they usually do. They usually produce for us an optimistic and a pessimistic scenario, but now they're also producing some scenarios that have to do with different paths of the pandemic, and they choose the path that they think is most likely, and that's the one that they give us as their baseline. And then they assign subjective probabilities to that. So they're, they're most likely scenarios, the one that I presented, um, but it doesn't have a really high amount of probability assigned to it. So that's evidence that they're saying, this is our most likely, but a lot of other things are possible. Um, and they have said that they aren't forecasting a second wave in the fall, but they have dampened growth um, as a way of incorporating that possibility. So there's no explicit second wave in their forecast now. There might be later in the summer. Um, but they feel like they have hedged that by dampening growth in some in some types of consumer spending in particular. And that's often how when we do forecasts, that's often what we do too, is that we um, we can look at the US forecast and then if we know that something is different in Minnesota, we can alter that growth rate before we use it in our forecast. I think that's a good reminder to keep thinking long-term. Like you're saying though, like all of us are, are so focused on short-term thinking right now because we're in the, still in the middle of a pandemic and every day seems to change yeah. and matter and all that. But if we take a, a longer approach, maybe that fall surge has an effect, but it's a, a it could you know be stretched out a little bit if we think, if we don't just panic, right? I, that's I kind of like that. Just, just a lot of uncertainty. So maintaining yeah. flexibility is important in every business right now. Yeah, right. And personally, right? Save your money just yeah. in case. Uh, okay. That does get to all the questions that were asked in the chat room. Uh, if uh, I guess that's it. Do you have anything you want to add or, or follow up with? I don't think so. Well, this was great, Laura. I got to tell you. Um, what we're thinking of doing is kind of a weekly show, uh, maybe a half an hour instead of an hour. I would love to have you again on in the future and kind of update this maybe in the fall or, or, or early winter and see where we're at and follow up. That'd be great. But this was fantastic. Sure. This is great information. I hope people got a lot out of it. I see now people are saying thank you and stuff in the chat room. So we are going to sign off. If you're here for CE, I always kind of appreciate if you just go in the chat room and, and say something again or just put your name in so that um, when Katie goes through and marks everybody's attendance, it's really obvious. It's kind of a belt and sensor, it's a belt and suspenders approach. But we are going to sign off. Uh, I'm going to throw up a couple slides to thank everyone uh, with contact info and that we will have a recording of this available. And thank you. So, Laura, if you want to jump off, you can or you can stick around. But I'm just going to flip through a couple slides. Thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. Thanks.